That's hard to say, yeah. That's an interesting question. Interesting enough where I can't, I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My name is John Doran and I write about music. In this series for Noisy, I am interviewing notable figures from British popular music. For me, this has nothing to do with record sales, critical praise or fashionability, and everything to do with clarity of vision, iconoclasm, and a unique take on British life. This week I'm talking to Tricky, who was an early associate of the Wild Bunch and Massive Attack in Bristol, before releasing his groundbreaking debut album Max in K in 1995. During the culturally conservative mid-90s of Britpop, Tricky represented what it was actually like being British and living in a city as his music, his fashion, his entire aesthetic and philosophy were the product of embracing culture clash. We needed him then to kick against the pricks as much as we need him back now. It's my pleasure today to be talking to Tricky. Tricky, hi. How are you doing? Now, when I was 17, I had a much more beautiful body than I have now. I occasionally used to go to college wearing a wedding dress and it keeps you on your toes, doesn't it, wearing a dress? Yeah, yeah, because you can't be that macho. You can't be a tough guy with a, you know, he kind of breaks down the barriers, yeah. you know, and it takes a lot of bottle to a certain extent. It does, doesn't it? Obviously, you know, you've got dead good hip hop credentials, but that is like got to be the most ultra macho, masculine, you can't put a foot wrong kind of genre. Well, I heard, I don't know if it's true, but RZA, before we did the um, EP I did with them, he seen a picture with me with the dress on, someone showed him the album, and he was like, not sure. I don't know if this is true, but someone in Ireland told me he wasn't sure about it. There's some guys, right, there's some guys in hip-hop and I'm tougher than them with a dress on. <laughs> Funny, a lot of the rap guys have never um, mentioned it to me. The only time I've heard that was RZA was like, oh, what's, what's, this, what's with the guy wearing a dress? I think that kind of hip-hop's become really interesting again over the last couple of years. Whatever I think about the music, I think culturally it's gone dead, dead interesting recently. I'm not saying like, like hip-hop's come out of the closet, but there's, it's certainly it's, it's changed direction, you know. And it's, it's bound to, if you think it's like um, in, the, in the urban community, you, you know, you've got the tough guys, you've also got the homosexuals. One time they are going to get through, you know, so... And I lived in New York, right? A DJ guy invited me to a party, right? And he, this guy was gully, ghetto guy. Ghetto, ghetto DJ, right? And I was with a Puerto Rican girl. And the first thing I noticed when I went in there was like, it was easier to get in a prison than this club. Yeah. They checked under your tongue. You take your shoes off. They rub the bottom of your feet, a um, uh, metal detector. So you know you're going into a hard, core club right so i'm in there with this puerto rican girl and all of a sudden these four guys just went round her and i thought they were kicking it to her they're like one of these guys maybe are trying to kick it to her i realized i was in a gay club hip-hop club but i'm talking about there was nothing feminine about these guys at all yeah. they were heavy gang gangsters do you know what i mean so it's only a matter of time that got through, you know what I mean? So um, enough it's going to stay the same, you know? But it's funny seeing the older or the more hardcore saying rap so gay now and... I can understand why some rappers, like say for instance, Keanu West, I don't know if he's gay or not, I don't think he's gay, right? But the all fashion thing is, it's a bit too much. I think of you as, as like, you know, one of the top collaborators, you know what I mean? You really seem to kind of like thrive in working with other people. I was just wondering, one, why do you kind of gravitate towards working with other people? And two, are there any kind of artists out there who you, you know, you really just still love to work with? I always wanted to work with Kurt Cobain. His death was a shock to me because I always, always thought we would work one day. I never tried to contact him, yeah. but I thought we're bound to work. When you listen to someone and you love what they do, you know, to imagine them doing that with you is just like in inspirational. If I'm writing lyrics and you hear someone else's voice sing your lyrics, I've always found that a compliment, an honor to hear a beautiful voice because I can't sing. So like say, for instance, Martina on my first album, hearing her sing my lyrics was like a compliment to me and it made it more 
into poetry. Do you know when you get a song like Hell is Round the Corner, is this like an abstract expression of like a really dark emotion or a dark headspace that it's difficult to put into words otherwise? Well, the name came from, a, a friend was round my house and we were talking about, I can't remember what we were talking about, we were talking about hell or something like that. So he goes, listen, hell's round the corner because I was living at the time right next to the front line like a fucked up area, a messed up area. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. goes, hell is round the corner from your, from your house. So that lyric stayed with me. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. is kind of um, talking about ghetto, being in the ghetto, you know? Hell is round the corner where I shout is a schism. Believe in how the start that if you believe or deceit, common sense says shit. Before you were famous, you know, you used to hang with people like Mark Stewart and Nina Cherry and, and the Wild Bunch. How did you start hanging with these people and what was it like? You know, because bar probably no other post-punk scene in the country, the Bristol scene always sounded the most exciting to me. Well, Mark Stewart, I hung out, I hung out with more than those guys, but on a different level, like say Nina Cherry was more music. M Massive Attack was more music, but um, I knew Mark when he, he's always lived in squats and um, he's the first person to ever get me on stage and he's a um, slightly mad guy, he's slightly, yeah. he's slightly insane. Great guy though, great guy, got a big mouth sometimes, sometimes he's got a big mouth and he needs a slap, but he's unique character. But like you say, in amongst all the chaos, you know, there's a sharp mind going on there. Oh, he's and, a genius. And he, he spotted something in you because he was the first person to get you to record, wasn't he? Yeah, and the first person to get me on stage. The first time I ever got on stage was him saying to me, listen, so he definitely recognised something, but he never said, you know, he never told me. He just said one day, go in, I've got some studio time, I can't go there. Take it. So um, he's definitely um, something going on with that man. Do you know something tricky? I've never been able to pin you on this. I can't, can't work out whether you're a post punk fan who makes hip-hop or a hip-hop fan who makes post-punk? That's interesting, I don't know. I think that's hard to say. Maybe a bit of both. Yeah, yeah that's hard to say, yeah. That's an interesting question. Interesting enough where I can't, I have to think <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, You're back again with a new record label and a new album, both called False Idols. Yeah. I was wondering, can you talk me through why they're both called that? Like if you see some of the biggest artists in the world now, right? You know, none of them are saying anything. People live through them vicariously, you know, watch what they do, what they eat, try and act like them, try and be like them. But they're not saying anything. And I just think it's just one big lie. Do you know what I mean? It's just one big lie in smoke and mirrors, you know? It's just like, it's just too much, you know? It's just like um, with the guy who does it, who is the guy who does that um, TV show? Some Sun, pop idols. Sun yeah, it's like, who, who is the guy? Who is, who is this guy to say whether someone is good or not? How could he have an opinion? Who is he? It's just a, it's just a, a, a guy who dressed badly. You know, it's like people who sit on panels are rarely people who do anything. I'd like to see, go on that show and let anybody of them judge me. And I'd say, do you know what? I'll give you a day studio time and I'll have a day studio time. Let's do an EP, let's see what you do and let's see what I do. I think this is the most musically conservative time I can remember since it's the mid 80s. I just don't have a lot of respect for what's going on now musically and you know, it's, it's just either selling sex or, I, I, it's got to be one of the worst times for music now. It's got to be one of the worst times. I think so. I wanted to ask you, and I'm sorry about this in advance because you must be tired of getting asked about this, but I wanted to ask you about how you came to perform with Beyonce. She's got a dancer, she, one of her choreographers, this guy, and they were talking about having someone in England and he said me, which I thought was a weird choice. I was shocked, to be honest with you, when I got the phone call saying Beyonce wants you to feature. 
especially because I was banned from Glastonbury. Like, I can't play there. Something happened, I got the blame for it. So it was quite bizarre. I can't get a show there, but they let me in because Beyonce wants me there. Yeah. She shows she's got some muscle. And to be honest with you, I had to do it in for the perverse. Because, like, it's so perverse to go on stage. It's so perverse. And do you know what? My mic didn't work, right? Yeah. And there was smoke and lights and dancers. And then when my mic didn't work for the first few seconds, then I started just watching. It was like I was watching and I was just like, this is crazy, crazy. Has there been kind of like any kind of good come out of it? I mean, have you got like younger people kind of checking you out or anything like that? No, I don't think so. Like my record sales ain't gone up or, <laughs> you know, I'm not selling records like Beyonce. Um, What's she like? I was quite shocked how down to earth she was. And I'm, I was quite shocked how down to earth Jay-Z was as well. All right. Because, okay, yeah. you know. Um, Which makes with Chris Martin, isn't it? Oh, is he? Yeah. And do you know what? Chris Martin, what a nice guy. Oh, is he? Oh, I'll tell you what. You're shattering all my illusions today. Well, I wanted to say thanks very much for doing this. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank so, you very, very much. much. Can I get you to sign something for of me? Of course. I'm going to do it over Martina's face. <laughs> Our daughter's singing now. Is she? Yeah. Oh, that's great. And, so, and she sounds like her mum. Um, cheers, man. Thank thanks, you very much. Mate. Thanks again.